Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing good. Uh, the skies are grey here, but our hearts are full of sunshine because uh, we have Grace and Tom and all of you with us uh, this morning. Thank you all so much for being here. You're absolute legends. Uh, let's have a lot, a lot of fun uh, over the rest of this hour. Um, if you haven't already, uh, don't forget to uh, pop where you're watching from in the chat. I can see some of you have already done so, or well, already a lot of you, in fact. Uh, I've seen folks in India, uh, uh, Italy, uh, someone said Italia, which really threw me there, Amsterdam, Cardiff, Australia, Nottingham, uh, Dublin, New Zealand, Exeter, Derby. Uh, it's going very, very fast now, so I'm going to stop. Um, and while you're there, you'll be able to see on my screen right now uh, some instructions on making sure that you switch your messages from hosts and panelists uh, over to everyone so everyone can see your messages. So you just need to head into your chat feature, uh, click that little toggle that says hosts and panelists and just move it over to everyone so everyone can see your messages. Uh, that way we can have a really great chat throughout the duration of today's session. Today our guests are the incredible couldn't be nicer, couldn't be smarter, couldn't be more interesting, uh, Grace Kite and uh, Tom Roach. Uh, Grace is from Magic Numbers, so I'm going to pop this up on my screen, uh, and is just the most lovely human being in the world. Uh, Tom said a very lovely line as he came on, which was that uh, Grace is the absolute embodiment of her brand, um, and, and she just lives and breathes being very smart and very lovely. Uh, Grace has two upcoming courses uh, and she's actually given the Marketing Meetup community a £200 discount code for that. So uh, the first course is called Scaling Up Works and that helps you find the right mix of performance and brand marketing. And then the second course is called Data Works, which helps you get to grips with data to give you your marketing the magic touch. Now I'll leave those two QR codes up while I introduce Tom. Uh, if you're interested in the discount codes, you just need to follow those uh, QR codes. We also have uh, Tom Roach, who is the VP of Brand Planning at Jellyfish. He is an interesting, thoughtful human who's a genuine industry leader, evidenced through his multiple gold IPA effectiveness awards and general industry legendary vibes, uh, a very, very good human. Uh, today, we're gonna do something uh, slightly different. So Grace and Tom will be questioning each other after, uh, after I've done the first sort of like leading couple of questions. So it's a really easy day for me. Uh, we're gonna be doing a session based on marketing effectiveness. Um, and it's an ultimately an important topic because as marketers, we need to be doing stuff that needs to be effective. <laughs> uh, this conversation will be sort of like intermediate advanced, I expect, uh, but I'll be doing my best to sort of jump in where needs to be uh, to, to clarify any points. Um, thank you all, by the way, for your lovely, lovely chat comments. Uh, I can see them coming through. Um, it's just lovely. Hello to Sarah in uh, Stoke-on-Trent. Uh, lovely to see you and Gary in Northampton. Um, don't forget to use the Q&A because we'll take time at the end to answer your questions um, after we've done that. And the last thing for me to do before we get started with the, the session is to say a big thank you to our sponsors. Now, this week, our featured sponsor is Frontify. Uh, they enable you to uh, keep your brand consistent. They incorporate elements of DAM, so uh, data asset management, um, to enable you to keep all your assets in one place, but they also help you keep your brand guidelines in there and stuff like that. So you're ultimately able to collaborate with all of your team. Now, Frontify, in that QR code on there, uh, have done a study of 450 CMOs uh, about the right time to invest in brand. So if you would like to get that, there's no details required. You just need to press the button and you get the PDF. Um, head over to, to that link right there. Also, a big, big thank you to the rest of our sponsors, uh, Exclaimer, Cambridge Marketing College and Redgate. We'll feature each of those in the following weeks. Now, that's my introduction done. So, the first question, uh, and this goes to Tom to start off with, um, can we understand what we mean by uh, marketing effectiveness? Is there a bit of a potted history that you might be able to give folks uh, just as, as they head into today's session, just for some context? Okay, um, the potted history, I'm not so sure about the real, like true deep history of it. Um, I haven't studied it, but I imagine it does go back to the sort of 70s and the, the classic people like um, Kotler, 
Um, so if you if you want to get into your your classic Martin textbooks, that's probably where it all starts. The the bit where I I kind of pick up though is the is is nineteen eighties onwards where the IPA effectiveness awards were established in nineteen eighty. So when you get into advertising effectiveness, which of course isn't all of Martin effectiveness, but part of it, uh, the IPA's um, efforts from nineteen eighty onwards to 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 gather as much data on on the effectiveness of advertising, really prove the value of advertising, prove that it works, obviously from kind of slightly selfish industry perspective, but that body of case studies, there's now 2000 case studies with the, the data bank that, that, that comes off the back of those case studies and those awards um, is, is uh, kind of unprecedented in, in, in the history of marketing and advertising, really. It's, it's the thing that all of Les Burnett and Peter Field's work is based on. So you'll, you'll, whenever you get those charts, say IPA data bank, that's where that data comes from. So all of the kind of history of what what works or what has worked over over history is is in that is in that um, body of work, and and then that that sort of um, movement to prove the the power and value and commercial value of advertising, I think goes hand in hand with the measurement, which again Les Burnett is kind of fully wrapped up in. He there's there's a, there's a brilliant econometrician called. Louise Cook, who's really the doyen of, 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 of econome advertising econometrics. And she actually, she was at, at BMP DDB, I think it was probably called then, or it may have been the previous iteration of DDB. She hired Les. So she was an econometrician, hired him, trained him. Um, so I think his degree was in, I want to say, it might even have been machine learning or quant quant physics of some kind. Um, and and then there's this kind of canon of brilliant econometricians who essentially were from from Louise to, to Les to a whole load of others, including Grace, who was I think in some ways trained by by Les and and introduced us. So we were by working, Louise actually by Louise, right? So mm -hmm. we we and I can't remember exactly when we worked together, but it was on some IPA effectiveness awards when I was at Adam and Eve DDB. So back end of 2019, 2020. So that's when when Grace and I kind of started starting to do stuff together. Not that we're part, I mean, I would put myself in the history of, of marketing effectiveness in any way. <laughs> but there is this kind of long line of brilliant measurement people who come up through the advertising world. Um, and it's an interesting kind of, there's there's this, there's this kind of, it's quite a bespoke, quite sort of small number of people who are really experts in it. And it's, and of course that's been sort of turned into an industry and the, and the big media agencies have, Big econometrics and measurement um, capabilities that really have their roots in those those individuals. Um, so it's it's a it's a really I mean, it's a, I mean you did say geek out and we could go much deeper <laughs> than that. But that very geek positive on the advertising side. Geeking out is good, and and even if you don't put yourself in that bracket, then I'm I'm, I'm sure we will, uh, Tom. Um, Grace, did you have anything to add there? Um, just on, on on what Tom has just spoken through. Yeah, and I think it is all about measurement and being able to measure. And I remember in the eighties, actually, in the and and the, the the nineties when we were doing measurement for the first time. And I actually, in my first ever job, had um, numbers on a dot matrix printer that I had to type into Excel version one point zero. It was a bit after Les and Louise, but I always picture them in the eighties with kind of luminous pink socks and big dangly kind of earrings. I'm sure they weren't doing that, but that's how I picture it. <laughs> and that reminds me of the, the, the history of it will be connected with the, the history of data and computing and computing power. And so yeah. that, that also suggests what the future of it's going to be about um, with, with, with AI, whatever we, we, we think of that in, in measurement terms. But when it, and your, the other question, which was like, what, what is marketing effectiveness? I think it's really simple. It's having a really clear strategy and objectives for your marketing, really, really strong um, approaches to measurement, which are going to help you understand how you're achieving those objectives and then using that measurement to understand how you, you know what where you are on that journey and then feeding that learning back into back into the in, into the process of, of developing your marketing communication next time so it's it's it's, it's it goes it's, it's all about strategy for me it's not uh, um whenever people talk about what does effectiveness mean what does evaluation mean i'm always keen to talk about how effectiveness is it's a cultural thing it's part of the whole process it's not something that just happens at the end of the process because you it, i think it probably goes wrong if you if you're if you're just talking to your measurement people at the very end once you've once you've developed your plans and your and your your marketing material mm, i love that thank you for that 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 last bit there as well because i think that sort of um 
certainly speaking from personal experience more than anything you know there's 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 a lot of um conversation around these things and sometimes it can feel quite inaccessible um but even as a, a starting point there just to sort of put a couple of sentences which sound incredibly simple and and, and clear um really helps take us on the journey for the, for the rest of today's session um so let let me make my last question and then i'm going to pass over to to you grace and and, and tom to take take it from here um so you both did a pretty cool thing um not that long ago where you famously uh, collaborated on on the third age of effectiveness on a big cool stage in in can uh, and basically it was this idea that there's never been a better time to be in marketing um, returns are on the up and so I guess the the question is how do we know that and and why is it <laughs> um, Ray, so you better take that right I'll take this one yeah leave this one so so the the first age of effectiveness when we were doing sort of traditional things like TV or posters um radio um the second age I guess was when we first started using online media um and the third age is now where we've been using it for a little while um, and I recently was doing a speaking gig with a big crowd and I said, hands up if you think the third age is better than it's ever been before. Um, and, you know, some of the audience put their hands up. Hands up if you think the third age of fake news is worse than it's ever been before. And quite a lot of people put their hands up there too. And th there's this thing where actually, do we know whether it's improving or not, whether the world is improving or not? And um so I went and looked at it and I got together this data source with, with the IPA. Actually, I'm sitting in the IPA's basement today. They've got a really cool bookshelf behind me. Um, <laughs> and I, um, I, I looked into this with the IPA, collected through loads of data from lots of different econometrics providers and looked at whether returns from advertising were improving or not. And what you can see in, in that data is that... Um, Actually, the returns from advertising took a bit of a dive when we first started experimenting with online, when we were practicing, getting used to it, and we were moving away from things we knew how to do to experiment with these new things. But then after a while, somewhere around the middle of the 2010s, returns to effectiveness started going, going up again, and they've been going up quite quickly. Um, so actually, the third age is better than we've ever had before. And we, we sort of dug into the ARC data, that's that econometric source I was mentioning, to say, where is this recovery concentrated? And it's concentrated where people shop and research and spend time online. So where they're reachable with online ads when they're thinking about their purchase. So that is where the learning has now taken place. And we're using online ads in quite a sophisticated way, getting the right options on things like objectives for social media channels. And, and moving away from formats that can be gamed by bots or targeting in the right way. And return on investment has, has just reached a, a new, stronger level. Um, and in the CAN talk, where Tom and I were very lucky to hang out with Les Binet, we also got a, a, a cut from the IPA data bank that Tom was talking about a minute ago to look at the long lens for, in their data. And what we could see there was that actually in that, in that second age when we were learning to use online ads and, and returns were sort of going a bit downhill while we were learning, um, actually the, the horizons for payback were really, really short and getting shorter. People wanted their payback now, now, now. And they, there was a, a bit of, a, a, of a, a move away from brand building. But actually that also had a turning point in the mid 2010. So another part of the reason for the recovery and effectiveness is that people are starting to balance the long and the short or the brand and activation or brand and performance or much better than 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 they did before and, and that's another part of the turnaround i think you, so, um it, it's it's a brilliant story isn't it it's a really really brilliantly positive story i sometimes feel like um in these big industry narratives there's a bit of like you know oh we used to be shit and now it's great or vice versa and i, yeah. I get i get um whilst i was really you know, a big um, advocate of the of, of the part of the story, which is we are learning better to use these tools that we've got, and we're try we're getting better at combining the foundational knowledge of how marketing works with some of the new technology. Um, I sometimes get um, uh, nervous that we that, that there's too much nostalgia in the industry, and that a lot of the narrative that you you see put out there, whether it's there's a crisis in effectiveness 
or um, the, the previous talk to ours the previous year had been called Triple Jeopardy. And it was like, doom, doom, doom. And I don't really buy the the the, the nostalgia or it's shit. It's uh, it, you know it's been terrible and now you know and, and we're in we're we're going to hell in a handcart, whatever the phrase is. But humans um, make progress, don't we? You yeah, know, progress is going. Oh, well, let's throw away the good stuff and keep no, the shit course. stuff. <laughs> and I get I also I get quite um like when when there are people who who just look back and just want to look back at the you know I love the TV commercials of the eighties and nineties. It's what I grew up with, right? Um, I would, of course, I'd love to live in a world where there was some of that great creative work out on our big screens in our, in our sitting rooms. That's not so much the case anymore. It's happening elsewhere. Creativity is moving on. Things move on and we shouldn't live in the past. Um, so I feel like I, I just want to temper the kind of things were shit, now they're great um, narrative with a bit of reality of, I think, I suspect... 5% of everything is, or well, 95% of everything is mostly a bit shit and 5% is really brilliant. And that's probably always the case, regardless of the time. But I do, I do. Uh, having said that, I absolutely do buy the the, the, the stuff that we were talking about, which is it, th these new platforms, we're getting better at using them. The, the history of digital being initially and primarily a direct response set of platforms and channels that is that is disappearing as creative people get a handle on how to do things creatively with it, um, and as video platforms become more the norm, and so video is baked into it, obviously TikTok is video first, and, and YouTube was born that way, and, and video is where brand building is is particularly prevalent, and so um, I'm kind of a big big advocate for how we're all getting better at it. We're we, we're using the tools better. We, we're using some of the, the 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 intelligence and the history of what works better, and and just that there's a kind of progress narrative there, which I like. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And I think when I mean, you you've talked about it in terms of of bothism, which is a term that's come about recently, it's been um, used by Mark Ritson and others. It came. He riffed off your work with that, didn't he? Um, yeah. What, what wrote... does it mean to you? Well, so I wrote a thing called The Wrong and the Short of It in, I actually wrote it in 2020. Um, it was the first or second blog I published in the middle of 2020. Um, and it, it got a lot of reads and he read it and passed it around. And and um, somebody in a comment when when Ritson shared it on LinkedIn said that this thinking and the stuff you're doing, Ritson, will be become known as the Bothism School. And so that, that kind of term was coined then. Um, and yeah, bo bothism. I was annoyed actually because I was like, oh, I should have, I should have called it that. It's a really good, it's a really good philosophy. Um, it gets to the heart of what. And my bit, by the way, on the wrong and the short of it was really, it was just a rip off of Bet Binet and Field, which is my my secret. My whole career is basically a little kind of rip off of Binet and Field. But what what I what um so the, the bothism was was really to go. There's this word in the middle of long and short of it, which is obviously the great book by Bennett and Field, which gets forgotten because Bennett and Field get talked about as being, I even saw them described as the high priests of the long term, which is, of course, ridiculous and pretentious, but also is wrong because they both believe in both. The word and is, is in the centre of the title of the long and the short of it, and that word gets ignored and forgotten. Um, their very famous chart that does that with that it says do both of those things and you will you will do really well um you can't you and, and actually the thing that i started to say was i think sometimes in 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 uh, in marketing advertising we sometimes get it wrong in, not only by being really short termist but there are other people that get it wrong by being really wrong like long termist and only wanting to do the big the big kind of the big brand campaigns and creating lots of demand or future demand and then not actually um harvesting that demand through tactical use and smart use of, of digital channels to really har harvest the demand they're creating. So it is about balancing, um, uh, building uh, building future demand by creating the right brand associations for your brand and then harvesting that demand really efficiently in the right channels um, for those There's people. a few analogies for it, isn't there? Like I, I use the one of, there's no point in having a really high tech fishing net if you haven't got a pool full of fish and the brand building is putting the fish in the pool and then the performance or the direct response activation is, is like fishing them out and turning them into customers. 
it's a great one i like um, i think Ritson talks about there's two ones he uses one is um uh watering your tree and then picking the fruits and yeah. then uh, the other one which i like is um, an alley-oop in basketball so the, the the long pass and then the and then the dunk the two things that can't be done separately uh, well you can probably dunk alone i don't know i don't know about basketball um but you can't you an alley -oop needs both both those things and it's a really good thing to do in combination i think all of this theory is basically trying to make sense of a, th this this big change we've seen in 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 advertising which was we used to have you know a couple of big tools to do the long and a couple of big tools to do the short now we have this vast array of platforms that were really re have become started out being really good at the short and now i think we're getting better at, at combining them and using using digital for for both, um, and it happened. And of course, digital can do digital means all sorts of things, doesn't it? But it's particularly it is 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 has, was was more famous for the short, and now we need to get better at the longer bit. Yeah, and the, I mean the two things do work together. You see that in the in the measurement as well. Like I see that through our work all the time. That um, you know, actually, you know, if if you if you do do brand building. You see the return on investment for your performance go up and if you do do performance and direct direct response you see the overall effect of your of your brand building be able to last longer and 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 be activated more and and it works it's because you know you're harvesting the demand that you're creating from your brand building and actually it's it's really helpful because that that effect actually shows up in things that the performance marketing can see yeah the performance marketing team can see and that's important, actually, because sometimes they can be a bit of a blocker to brand building. They can go, well, actually, I don't really fancy this ethereal thing. I want to put a pound in and get £50 back. And they think it's really transactional. It's just like putting money in a slot machine and out comes more money. And it, um, and it can be like that, right? But then those pesky brand marketers on, you know, on in, in the other, in, in, maybe on the other floor sometimes with different objectives are seen in somehow in conflict or stealing their money or there's a bit of conflict. I love it when I talk to marketing people and they have a combined team, they're unified, they have good relationships with their performance uh, colleagues. They probably ideally got the same boss. They're, they, they're, they're being led by somebody that, that understands both. Maybe they are individuals that understand both. Um, yeah. and they've got, Those are the most effective departments, aren't they? Where you've got yeah. the people meeting at the corner totally um and they've got metrics that they're and objectives that they're being set that are that are consistent and work together and not conflicting because of course we we all know that that pressure of short-termism um and and sometimes putting off the, the bigger things you, you you could do which are about casting the net wider and and do, doing something big for the future and that's you know in busy times that's that all affect that that um kind of problem affects us all in everything that we do not just our marketing and advertising yeah, and you've got you just give. I mean, the thing where I've seen it work, getting getting past those kind of blockages, is just pointing out to the performance marketing team that you know things like your click through rate on your search mm. ads is going to go up if you do brand, or and your dwell time on the site is going to go up, and that means your conversion rate on site is going to go up, and you're gonna you're you're going to go up the organic rank rankings because of this brand campaign that you're doing. And all of that's going to make the performance marketing team's job easier and better. So they're going to look good as a result of it. And that's something that like just helps you move on a little bit. That that data is so important, isn't it? I remember um, maybe about 2018, I was trying to collate a sort of set of data and charts on the value of brand. Um, and it was unbelievably hard to gather the, the right sources. I suspect now, in fact, we should look at it and do it again, because I bet you... There's a load of um, great data points that you could pull out. Just the, you know, he, here's a brand that was doing some 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 brand stuff as well as um, some 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 more short term stuff. And here's the click through rate on the short term stuff that was higher. Or this is the, I don't know, the, the base sales are higher or whatever. That the, these are really interesting. I mean, there's probably a load of very specific data points that you've got um, in your locker, Grace, that could be useful to people to see. I think. Well, that's a to do. Then we'll put that on a to do list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, also. Occasionally Sorry. go back at these articles I've written and think, oh, that's God, I wouldn't write that now, or that that chart looks horrible, or that um that data point looks about outdated, or I've changed my mind now. So <laughs> that's things is good. These things that people are always still massively referencing because they're really useful to everyone on your in your blogs. I need to need to update some of it because it's you know goes out of date, doesn't it? Sometimes. Yeah, I suppose. Well, talking about the to-do list, one of the things we we've been talking about as a sort of 
kind of loose to do for 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 this year is to kind of solve brand building in the platform world like how do you do it um and you you're, you're I think we we sort of loosely sometimes work where you, where you think about creative sometimes and I kind mm. of sometimes think mm. about media we sometimes work that way together I think you're fur further on thinking about how you do it in creative than I am but I've got some ideas about how you do it in media do you want to say a bit about how you do it Basically, creatively yeah it's funny the more I think about it and the more like I mean so so and that's really what I did on the the stage at Cannes so last year the my bit on the third age of effectiveness was 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 basically going I, I identified the I mean, it's not a new problem but this issue around attention is an issue in in d digital uh, channels particularly um because the, the screens are smaller and they and the, the the formats that we've got are, are shorter so there is an issue around um how how many seconds of attention you can get from people when they're watching your advertising and of course we all know that the more that the more you engage with a piece of content the more you're likely to be um to to, to have your uh your 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 memories of that thing enhanced or your your perceptions of it reinforced in some way so there is a connection between the amount of seconds of attention which sounds quite mechanistic and the amount of brand memories you're able to create and the more memory you're able to create the more chance of of, of future future sales you can create so there's there is an issue with digital channels being just not quite as good as as some of the you know as with a 30 second TV ad, you can get on average about 13 seconds of attention, apparently, according to some of the data. With a 15 second YouTube ad, it's about six or seven seconds. With a Facebook ad, it might only be a couple of seconds. Bit of a problem, that, isn't it? Um, and so with this array of channels we've got, we need to be really, I mean, I hate the word, but choiceful about the platforms we use and the and the, uh, and the formats we use. Um, I'm a, I'm pretty uh, big on TikTok. No, I'm not big on TikTok. I'm, bi I'm, I'm bullish about TikTok uh, because I think it's a really engaging and creative platform where loads of interesting things are happening. And when when people are on TikTok, they seem to engage that bit more with, with, the, with the content. Um, and that I think is a clue to, to, what, to what you need to be doing in digital. It's about video. It's about it's about grabbing people. It's about being native to the platform as best as you can be. So all of the different platforms will tell you that the best way to, to be effective on their platform is to create content that's bespoke to that platform rather than doing what some of the big advertisers still do, which is make your big telly ad and then chop it up into bits and stick it on the stick it on the Internet. Um, that is not best practice. It's cheaper. It's um, it's kind of it's an easier job. You don't need so many people to do it. Um, it's a bit easier to organize. But the reality of doing creative work in each it, um, for the platforms is you do need to be pretty attuned to what works on each one creatively and in media terms. And so, uh, I mean, probably starting with a couple of platforms which are video focused and getting really attuned to how your brand can operate in those in those in those platforms is the right way to do it they all, all the platforms talk about um, uh, like grabbing people's attention not necessarily just by some of the old rules that meta would say was like make sure your branding's up front make sure your key message is there i actually think that's a bit of a guaranteed way to only get two seconds of attention and not getting any more because once people know what brand you, you are and what you're saying they don't need to to, to to watch anymore but if you start off by really engaging people and intriguing them and, and giving them a sense of the value or that there is going to be value from continuing to watch, then that's a great way to start your story. And then and, and then the kind of, there's this classic learning where you, you two talk about um, emerging story arcs, so creating a, a high level of attention to start with and then multiple peaks of emotion throughout, throughout, throughout the video, however long it is. And I think that's something we can learn from in, in terms of the way we construct our stories and tell stories in, in video particularly. So that's a bit of a kind of potter's history. So there's a, I do a kind of, I think it's about A, B, C, D, E. So attention, branding, uh, communicate through stories. Emotion is still really important. And I just missed out D, which is difference is still really important as well. So A, B, C, E, D in that case. Um, I that. <laughs> I'm probably supposed to ask you a question now. And I, I need to look, <laughs> look at the well, question. I was going to, I was going to, um, have a go at what yeah. is, what's the media thing for. Yeah, yeah please, please. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, I must say that I, I think this is an area where we don't entirely know the answer. Like, how do we do brand building in a world where TV doesn't get the reach that it used to? Um, 
you know, because it's always been the history, isn't it? You, you know, you get a 30 second ad, you put it on TV, everybody sees it. Um, you it signals that you're big because everybody's seen it, um, and it signals that you're good. Um, and then you know, that's a, a really rich media channel, it's got sound, it's got visuals, it's got movement, and that gets into people's minds and they remember it. So that was the the way you do do brand building, you know, sort of beginner's guide, sketch out a brand building thing, it's probably got TV in it. Um, but what about in a world where TV doesn't get the reach that it used to? Well, one idea is that because you can't reach everyone with broad reach TV ad anymore, you have to use lots of different channels. And you talked about different channels and how they're different in terms of the amount of attention you get and the mode, the, pe the mind pe mindset people come to them with and how different um, creatives have to be, have to be different. And one idea I've got about the future of brand building is that actually that kind of fragmentation isn't necessarily a bug. It could be a feature, like the modern stack of media channels is a, is a genius thing to be able to work with. Um, and the data shows consistently, it's, it's across a lot of different meta studies, that um, if you use more channels, you get a higher return on investment. So the more channels you've got in your campaign, the higher the return on investment that campaign will be. It's in the ARC database that I mentioned earlier, and it's also in the work by James Herman and Walk on creative, creative commitment. And so the, 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 the idea there is that if we can use different channels to do different but related jobs, we build up more rounded campaigns that build brands in different ways that are appropriate for different people. Um, and we see it in our econometrics as well, that a lot of little works together to add up to more than the sum of the parts. I mean, there is an art to this route as well, as, as well as kind of the science. It's, you know, you, you have you to get it right. You have to have something that's very consistent across all of those different places so that you're not confusing people or asking them to take on too many different messages. So there's a, a, a need for a look and look and feel consistency across the diverse platforms. So brand branding as well as brand building that matters. So that, love, that's one idea. I love that. I mean, that because we've been talking about this, this idea of lo lots of littles for a while, and I really like the, 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 um, the justification for that being um, so important. And actually it has its roots in something we've all have known for a while, which is multiple channels are good. Um, yeah. It's just, we've sort of maybe uh, in the debate about what the hell do we do when linear TV reach is declining, um, this kind of crisis. I, th I think one of the big crises that people have had in the industry has been around that, actually. It's, and I think that's the, the kind worry. Of, it's the worry that, you know, we used to have this big bazooka. We don't have it. Um, we still have it, but it's not quite so effective in reaching some of our new audiences. Um, and we may not have the money for it. And um, the, how, how do you, when all the marketing science says try and be always on rather than bur big bursts and TV was obviously, you know, historically been quite good at big bursts. Um, I think it's it's really interesting, this kind of sense of creating our brands out of loads of little pieces, um, so long as they don't fragment and dissipate into nothing. And I yeah. think that's really where the branding piece comes in and the consistency of making sure everything you do is orchestrated and telling the same story or or, or, or telling a new, a slightly new angle in on, a, on the same story, should we say. So that yeah, it's, it's a modern um, rationale for, for branding, a new a new reason to for consistency. And, you know, people have always talked about consistency over time, like keep the campaign for a little while so that it beds in. Um, but also now consistency across patent, across platforms and all these little touch points sort of really, yeah. really matters. Yeah, because the old, I mean, the, when I was at BBH, we used to talk about moving it on without moving it off. There was always this crisis of, You've done a big thing um, it was on brand, it worked um, or, and it's begun to maybe work less well. When do we move on to the next thing? It was a kind of linear progression. I wonder whether now we're dealing with a situation we've got lots of things happening together and the, it's more about the connection points and how you move things on and off uh, yeah. brands um, within or across the across the platforms in some way. There's a di there's a diagram that you and I need to to, to create. And work on. <laughs> um, you don't, have you done I it? Can I just jump in here? Because like oh, I, I wanted to ask a question about like I, I love this point. I think it's 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 really wonderful. And and to me, as someone who sits within um a slightly smaller business, um, you look at people like the Paul Dyson study, which sort of says about like the size of your business being one of the main determining factors of the success of your campaign. But as I hear you speaking about like lots of little works. Uh, for me, that gets me quite excited in a way because I'm like, oh, as a small business, actually, you know, we could be doing 
lots of little smaller things you know deliver consistently granted it's all relative to bigger companies who um potentially you know can still do little but bigger if that makes sense um mm -hmm. but you know I'm, I'm interested in your pers perspective here grace you know does that does that open up a little bit of a gap for small businesses potentially um in in the historic um sort of world of 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 marketing literature and, and knowledge yeah i'm i'm such a fan of smaller businesses i mean i know that sounds really like weird because there's so many of them and that's almost all of the economy but that the smaller businesses are growing faster and they are the driver of the economy and they are are, are what contribute to to how um the country as a whole progresses really um, and it's a shame, I think, that many of the um, effectiveness kind of being effective speakers are actually relying on things like the data bank or econometric studies and things like that, that only big companies do, really. Um, and we were really lucky at Magic Numbers um, because we had a spurt of growth around COVID. So we worked with loads of scale ups during that time because um, we were quite small and they were quite small. And it was a massive, it was a really good match and it just all worked really well together. Um, and so we've been sort of thinking about what's the right thing for for for, for smaller companies, and it's part of what's in our scaling up works course that you flashed a QR code for at the beginning. But one of the things I wanted to pick up because I think this is also a bit about the future of brand building, and it is something that's accessible to smaller um, companies, is the role of influencers as as brand building um, media channels. Or I mean, it sounds awful because they're people you can't call them a media channel, but you know, um, something that you might buy to help you um, get into back brand building. Um, because influencers, they're, they're this new breed of like trusted people. And the, the thought is that we as smaller or, or sometimes bigger businesses can leverage their credibility for brand building. And actually smaller influencers, the evidence is that micro influencers um, get you more bang for your buck because every post that they do is, is more relevant for their smaller following. So you do a lot of micro influencers rather than one big one. And again, that's something that's accessible to smaller smaller businesses. And I wanted to tell you, I've got um, um, a survey that Walk did last year. And I thought it was fantastic when I saw it because they interviewed um, and surveyed like huge, huge numbers of, of, of people around the world and asked them what they thought about influencers. And three quarters of people, sort of between 72 and 78% of people were super, super positive about influencers. They believe that influencers promote products and brands in the followers' best interest. They believe that they promote products and brands that are reliable. They believe they promote products and brands that um, are good value for money. And, and that's what the followers believe about what, what, the, what, what um, influencers say. So it's no wonder really that spending on this has been growing quite rapidly. Um, and it's also no wonder that we're seeing in our econometrics and in a, in a lot of places that this is actually working like a brand building channel, that the effects of doing an influencer campaign like that is a long lasting. They're, they're not just kind of now and, and gone. I think on this point about, sorry, sorry, Jim. No, go ahead, Tom. Uh, you, you've got good things to say. <laughs> the, um, the, what you have to remember is that, that Google and, and Facebook Meta they are basically funded by millions of small businesses. They've they created, um, they, they, they've made advertising accessible to small businesses. And the way they are actually set up is far more attuned to the simple, easy kind of plug in and play approach that a small business needs than a big advertiser. So in many ways, they're, 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 those platforms are, are, are better for small businesses. And, and I think it's probably part of this story is, is is um is, is the way that small businesses are um are kind of able to advertise and again able to to do something they couldn't really do before because previously what would they do stick you know st stick something in the yellow pages something in the local post office i'm being you know you know local local papers not they didn't have access to the to to this much wider um uh, audiences and footprint that the digital gives gives them now so that's a really big big part of this the, the other thing is I just think this point about um, the IPA data bank is, and, and some of the data we use is based on the success of very successful companies. And they are the 0.01% of all advertising spend probably when it comes to the award winners at the IPA or CAN or somewhere. The, the mm -hmm. vast array of the, the, whatever it is, $700, $800 billion worth of global advertising spend is not spent with those. 
Um, I mean, there are some parallels that that follow over, right? Okay. So, you know, so TV might work for big businesses because it's it's that rich media, and you've got sound and movement and and yeah. and visuals. Online video is like that, but for 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 um, so you get the same kind of longer lasting effect. Yeah. But um, actually, now small businesses can do it just with your phone, like you know, just yeah. do a, do a TikTok. Completely accessible, rock. isn't it? Like, so my fifteen year old, um, he went into the local trainer store in Cambridge and he said, your TikToks aren't very good. I can make them better for you. And has managed to be part of a little team there that grown the, their TikTok followers from 900 to 20,000 just in the local area, which, and half of those are, are, um, are like, like Cambridge locals, not like people globally who are just sneakerheads. So that's, that's one small store with a tiny turnover on a bad week they will make more money from TikTok and views from TikTok than they will selling trainers. It's kind of unbelievable what's what's possible. And that's that sort of, I think, bringing a lot of these different themes in. So there's a kind of influencer, creator-led thing going on, small business, access to, to new technologies, to video, um, almost free in terms of its ability to create content. I mean, he gets paid a, a, a tenner and then two quid fifty for, 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 for posting the video. <laughs> That's I'm, I'm going to check it out now. I need some box fresh trainers. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, could, could could I uh, ask one follow up question? And I'll, I'll shut up because I, I know that we've got a lot of interesting things, a lot of open uh, questions from the community as well. But I, I saw a perspective shared by uh, an influencer the other day who um, has accumulated a large following in TikTok, and their perspective was that when brands are working with um, individuals um, who are influencers or ambassadors, as, as the chat's going on, you and I here, um, <laughs> that, the, um, that the brand almost needs to throw away their brand guidelines and let the, the, the influencer be authentic and, and turn up as themselves and stuff like that. And I kind of don't think there's any better people to ask you know, I, I read that and, and as a traditional marketing person, I went, oh, God, you know, that's not yeah. a brand. You lose your brand if if you allow folks to go completely off the rails. Yeah. But are we entering a different dawn? of? Um, I think it's, re it's a really tricky area. So if if you were to, I mean, you could go horribly wrong, right, by hire a thousand influencers, let them completely loose. A load of those will be rubbish. They won't They won't represent your brand in the right way. You will actually spend a load of money um on on not great reach and probably uh, overlapping audiences so i think there's something to do with making sure it's it and let's not forget this is really just a sort of modern smaller version um uh, democratized version of celebrity endorsement which has been a classic marketing tactic forever so this isn't new it's just smaller more agile uh, a bit more easy to do from 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 loads of different people out there on the streets i think there's a slight difference though isn't there in that um you know, influencers will do a better job for your selling your brand if they want to spend time with your brand. So if you can build a brand that people want to spend time with, then your influencer is going to bring them their authentic self and your brand to this party. Yeah. And that's what you want. And one of our brilliant clients at Magic Numbers is Little Moons. And they made a, a brand that, that people do want to spend time with because it's like cool and kind of like Asian and kind of these funky little ice cream things. And actually, as a result, they were a TikTok sensation and it, mm. it whooshed their business from being tiny yeah. to being in every Sainsbury's and Waitrose and everything. And at the core of that was making a brand that people wanted to spend time with. And then the influencers jumped on it and, 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 the content was authentic, but also branded. I, I, exactly, I and I love that story because the because none of those video, all of those videos have the product at their heart. The brand names there, you get people un unwrapping them, free defrosting them. That the, the stories that are being told in all those videos, even though most of them are just UGC, right? They're not being paid for. Mm -hmm. um, are of, of incredibly authentic to that product. I demonstrate the, their product demos. So that's that's unbelievable. The, and I, I love the next challenge that Little Moons now have, which is they gained loads of distribution as a result of, of that. How do they then keep that going? Well, the answer is bound to be paid advertising because only paid advertising can guarantee you the reach um, that, that, that all of that kind of um, you, you kind of grassroots user generated stuff cr created for them initially. I doubt they can they can make that happen again in, in organic. We have a lot of conversations at Jellyfish about how we combine the power of organic and paid advertising, particularly in social. So, you know, organic is great for 
for kind of testing things for little spikes of interest uh, and sometimes for reach. I don't think it's very good for guaranteeing reach on a permanent basis. In a, in a big businesses need predictable um, sales coming in. They need they need that stability because they've probably got factories. You need to be planning ahead. Small businesses suddenly get overrun with that, and then they need to scale up. And I think it's a, I I I, I just think this thing about how you combine organic and and paid in in social into and we call it one social at, at Jellyfish. Um, it's a it's a new thing, you know. There aren't very many people with experience of both, but again, it's another form of bothism which I'm really interested in. Part of the new world of platform totally. led brand building. Exactly, exactly. We probably won't solve it all before ten thirty. Though. I don't. I, we've got twelve more minutes. I don't <laughs> think that's gonna gonna happen. Um, I love that. Um, maybe if maybe if we take um, our last planned question and then we head over to the the Q and A. Um, because there's some fabulous questions in the in the Q&A as well. Um, and folks, if you want to give a thumbs up to any questions that you'd like us to prioritise, then we'll make sure that we take those. Um, so I'll jump in here and, and just ask uh, the last question because uh, it's an opportunity to, to throw it to both of you, uh, which is where do you see the future? Uh, what still needs to be learnt? Um, so Tom, maybe to you first. Well, what still needs to be learned is... The first answer, that part of the answer is the fundamentals continually need to be learned and relearned and relearned and retold because we forget them at our peril because it's very, very easy in, in, in any field, but particularly in marketing. We love shiny new things. And by, by talking only about the shiny new things, we forget the, the fundamentals, the basics, the tr things that will always be true. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in like the, the brain and the, hu you know, humans do not evolve very quickly. The brain doesn't change very quickly. And so understanding how we get at the unchanging person this is a really fundamental thing. So that that would be my first part of the question. And then so that's kind of ex exploiting what we already know and then exploring the new stuff is all, we have to balance the, the, the old with the new, um, the known with the unknown. Um, and so exploring new stuff and that for me at the moment ha has to be around how we can use AI to, to do what we're doing better and faster and maybe even cheaper. Um, uh, the thing I worry about there is I think we know that AI is going to make things cheaper and faster. Um, can it make things better? That I think that is still slightly unknown. Um, that will become m m better known over the next couple of years, I think. Mm. Love that. Uh, Grace, uh, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, I'm not sure about AI. We, we're using it to kind of zoop up some of our, our of our processes. Um, but a kind of bigger picture, I'm not sure where that's going, but that's definitely an interesting one to watch. Um, I reckon the, the fundamentals, though, um, those unchanging principles you just put in the chat, that's really, really important. And then a layer on top of that for me is skills in being able to read the outside world and go, how do I understand the data that I'm seeing um, to moderate those unchanging principles for my particular context? And that could be, you know, how do I get the right balance between brand and performance? How do I um, understand what the data I'm, I'm seeing is going to do to help me relieve any constraints that are holding back my marketing? And, and the, these, are, these are really some of the, the areas that the two courses that you've put a QR code up, up for there, thank you very much, uh, are kind of aiming at. And I think there's a lot marketing people can learn and, you know, we can get better at it. I kind of want, want the whole world to be more effective and that's why I started doing training. Not because I've got nothing to do. I'm very quite chocker. <laughs> <laughs> Deservedly so. I heard about your inbox before before we started today's session. So <laughs> it seems mad. Uh, thank you both. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating so far. I mean, we've got nine minutes left, so I want to make sure that we get to uh, some of the questions uh, from the community. But honestly, I think as you were speaking, my mind just sort of went through to like the world's largest blog post where, you know, there are so many rabbit holes that we could have gone down today. Um, so, you know, thank you both uh, for for giving that. And I think we definitely positioned today as like an opportunity to start at the top and then sort of follow uh, follow down any rabbit hole that sort of takes uh, your, your fancy. Um, so let's take some questions from the community uh, just to make sure that uh, we're getting to what everyone would like to hear today. 
Um, so the first one comes from Sarah. And Sarah says, I need to demonstrate the importance of brand to the shareholders in our organization who want uh, any investment to be tied to the bottom line. Um, I don't think you're alone in that question. Uh, could you share any examples or stats that could help that uh, and, and gives additional context of working in B2B professional services? But if you've got any broader examples of uh, examples or stats that can justify investment tied to the bottom line. Or indeed not. Uh, maybe me, Grace. Me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things that are out there in the public domain about, about what brand brand building generally does, about returns on investment that you might get from different types of media channels and different types of investments. And there are also some fantastic case studies for from businesses that your CFO or your board might aspire to be like. Um, we both love the Amazon one, don't we, Tom? Because it's one where they sort where Bezos sort of, sort of said, "Oh, we'll never do brand building," and then he turned out from his own data that he probably should, and so he does now. So we we love that one. So some of those types of evidences could be really really useful for your CFO. But what I've found over my careers is that um, senior people in finance and and that and that are answering to investors in the city need it for this business. So benchmarks and case studies are, are kind of not enough. Um, and in that case, the thing that really works is, is market mix modeling or econometrics. And, you know, we offer that magic numbers and it's um, something where, you know, I, it's part of my job to get the grilling from senior CFOs in big companies and smaller companies as well. And actually they do get it. They do get econometrics and they do get, get that as a method and they do, they do buy into it. So that's really the gold standard. Nice. I, I, I'd um, agree with that totally that I mean there are some general like quite good blog posts about the value of brand which which um, you know might help but that's only the general stuff um, the, the, the so, sometimes like just getting hold of a really good bit of data that's going to piss your CFO or finance people or investors off like just how bad your awareness is is often quite a useful one find mm -hmm. just get a piece of basic data on the awareness of your main competitor or the, the leader versus your awareness. And that that will they'll go, well, we only got 2% awareness. Well, we're not doing any awareness activities. Why are we not doing that? Because we can't afford it. We need some money to do it. Um, that's a really brutal and kind of basic thing, but sometimes just a really kind of bad bit of data and admitting it mm -hmm. may be quite a good way to poke the bear. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, it was a quote from Martin George from one of our webinars a couple of years ago now, which was um, speak the language of finance. Um, and it's not the same as the answer which you've just given, but it does, you know, remind me of, of similar shades of it. Yeah. Uh, with... that, and that is a great bit of general learning as well. The IPA uh, always talk about this particular, particular issue and they have great training on, on, on this sort of topic. Um, there's one, there's one thing I like, which is like, uh, ask them where, and this is more of a personal thing, like ask them where they got their Rolex. Why, why do they choose their Rolex? Why did, you, why did you choose that brand? Why do you drive that car? So yeah. they understand just in personal human terms, the, the value of brand. So it just takes them out of the, the spreadsheets a bit. I love that. Um, I like, next... I'll meet them in the spreadsheets. You take them away from the yeah. spreadsheets. <laughs> well, it's funny, yeah. you know, we talk about system one uh, and system two in marketing, don't we? And system, but our approach is to persuading people and selling them our, what we want them to do and to help us with tend to be system two. So how do we find system one, one ways of, of, of tapping into their emotions, tapping into their, their more human side or their personal side? And I think the both examples I've given probably do come at it that, from that perspective. Nice. I like that. There's the there's a, a comment mirrored to that uh, in, in the chat here from Paul, who says, I'm a strong advocate of, in brackets, sometimes scaring the crap out of people to get action, uh, which I like. Um, there's a follow-up to this question, which... Um, is is in a similar vein but maybe asked in a slightly different way uh, which comes from a great strategist in, in rob uh, who asks um if bothism is so obviously effective why are so many cmos despite their brilliant communication and persuasion skills unable to convince ceos slash mv uh, fds to invest in brand which bit of convincing evidence is still missing and uh, uh to offer a personal perspective I wonder whether there is any evidence missing. It, it strikes me that there is quite a lot of evidence already, um, but I, I definitely throw that to you first, maybe Tom. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a brilliantly put question because it it should because there's just a ton of data and evidence out there. Clearly, the data is not enough in my in my kind of view. Um, I think we need to get better at storytelling, and the 
the the the Amazon example is a great one. It's it's you know, this was somebody who is like the world's most famous business person was deeply skeptical about advertising and brand building. Um, he used to say it's tax on on a bad product. We don't do it. And then they learned from their own data that it did work. And now Amazon have built not um, a, a a brand that is probably one of the is the one of the largest advertisers and one of the best advertisers and brand advertisers to to boot and also has an enormous advertising business. That in itself is a phenomenal kind of U-turn, which should, should persuade somebody that, 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 this is, that this is a good thing to do. Um, I, I mean, at the end of the day, different businesses will different, have different priorities. You do hear people saying, I don't really need to, to, to spend money on a brand. I've got a perfectly successful business that is, that is working without it. That's a choice. Some businesses don't want to grow. <laughs> You'd be surprised mm. how many, you know, sort of a bit of data once they said, oh, you know, of, all businesses only you know 30 actually want to wind 30 percent want to wind down 30 percent want to stay the same 30 percent want to grow maybe they're they're in the in the camp that actually don't want to grow maybe ask right. that question do you, do you want to grow yeah interesting <laughs> no, i feel like you used the phrase uh, poking the bear earlier on but yeah. <laughs> really <laughs> um let's take the next one for layla because um I, I want i feel like this is a good one for you grace hopefully um who asks, what are your thoughts on the impact of Google's third party cookie depreciation rolling out this year on measurement, showing effectiveness and being able to compare periods of before and after? Um, you know, so, so you know, I guess to a broader theme, even if you can't ask, answer to the specifics, you know, the technological shifts which impact how we measure uh, all of this effectiveness uh, stuff. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's such an important thing this year um, that... You know, Google have been crying wolf about deprecating third-party cookies for ages, and now they're actually doing it. The wolf's with us. Um, some of those cookies have gone already. The rest are going to go by the end of this year for sure now. Um, and what it means is for performance marketing people, the signal that they're getting is now degraded. It's not as good as it used to be. You used to get quite a good signal to say, you know, this person that um, I could serve a search ad to has seen a load of other interesting ads on their way to this point. And now if I serve them a search ad, they're likely to convert. And so you could see who was the right person to, 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 to target to. And you don't get that anymore um, because of the cookies going. Um, you know, all of the algorithms, whether it's direct data driven attribution or multi-touch attribution, or um, even Advantage Plus, Plus and Performance Max, these, these AIs that sit within the platforms, they're all now only able to see last click like, um, like signals. So the signals are massively degraded. And what people are turning to um, is econometrics and market mix modeling. And I think, and I'm quite a positive person, but I think this is, could be a really fantastic moment because actually, if you don't rely only on cookies to tell you which um, which advertising work, it means you can do things that are untrackable and see whether they work or not. So you can bring them into your mix. And I think a lot of businesses that have been performance only will make this transition because of the cookies going and then suddenly start doing different and more interesting things and they'll grow faster because of it. Love that. It strikes me that we need another session another day about uh, modeling and, and stuff like that, because I, I think that's endlessly fascinating and really optimistic, which is a, a fabulous, um, a fabulous outlook. I, I like the thought that our best days are ahead of us somehow, um, and both as marketers and, and people, you know, so, so thank you. Um, I feel like, you know, we could carry on chatting all day, um, but we've taken our, 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 our allotted time. So I just wanted to say, Thank you so much. You know, thank you so much to both of you, uh, Grace and Tom, for for taking the time today. Um, thank you also to everyone in the chat for contributing your your questions, uh, your chat comments as we've gone throughout. Um, it's just really, really lovely. I also want to say a big thank you to Frontify. Once again, I'm going to flash their QR code up here. If you'd like the report on when to invest in brand from those 450 CMOs, do take the time to check out Frontify. They're very, very good people. Um, Annika there is just an absolute hero. Um, and also a big thank you to all of our sponsors, uh, Frontify, Disclaimer, Cambridge Martin College and Redgate. Thank you all for lighting up the chat with your thanks. I'm going to send that through to both Grace and Tom after today for a big old ego boost. Um, Grace's course can be found here. And last thing is that I'm going to make sure we capture the questions and send them through to Grace and Tom because Tom did a wonderful post 
uh, towards the end of last year about the things that really matter on LinkedIn. And uh, I figure the things that you're actually asking are the things that actually matter. So thank you all very much for today's session. We're back next week with uh, Sir John Hegarty uh, for uh, a hell of an interview. And uh, with all that said, have a lovely time. And thank you for taking the time today. Appreciate you all.